to our faculty, our faculty panel today. Uh, for, we will be recording this session for those who will not be able to join us synchronously. I'm Melissa Fogue from Catholic University, and Ellie Bernard Lesson from Gallaudet University will be monitoring chat today for any questions that come in. And uh, we are members of WRLC's Textbook Affordability Working Group, also known as TOG, the host of today's program. Us at TOG support faculty like you who want to replace expensive commercial textbooks with open textbooks and other affordable options for students. Our team members represent most of the WRLC schools. Please make a note of the contact at your school so you can follow up with them. If you don't see a representative listed for your school, please don't hesitate to reach out to open at wrlc.org with any questions. Today, I will be giving a brief introduction to open textbooks and their benefits, as well as the details of the review program and stipends. Afterwards, our faculty panelists, Alexa Alice Jubain and Eugene Montague from George Washington University and Dorothy Fair from the University of the District of Columbia will share their experiences of working with OER uh, with time for questions and answers at the end. Open textbooks are both similar to and different from commercial textbooks. They are similar to traditionally published higher education material in that they are written by faculty and experts in the subject area, specifically for college level courses, and also go through rigorous editorial processes, including peer review. They are different because they are online and completely free for students and faculty. They have flexible Creative Commons licenses, which give you great flexibility in how you can use them. And unlike standard copyrighted materials, the authors of open textbooks want you to be able to download, share, remix, and adapt their work as appropriate for your course. Open textbooks offer many advantages with respect to equity and accessibility. They equalize access to course materials for students by removing cost barriers posed by commercial textbooks. They are also immediately accessible to students and will remain so even after the course ends. Open textbooks offer pedagogical advantages to faculty. For instance, they allow faculty to be able to be more flexible when it comes to learning materials and can seamlessly integrate interactive elements like self-assessment and videos. Multimodal learning has been demonstrated to increase student engagement. To get started, take a look at the Open Textbook Library, learn from our faculty panelists, and give it a try yourself. By attending today's session, you are eligible to write a review of an OER textbook listed in the Open Textbook Library and receive a $200 stipend funded by the WRLC. After today's session, you will receive an email from the Open Education Network, which will contain instructions and all the information you will need. When the review has been completed, WRLC will email directions for receiving the stipends. And the link for the Open Textbook Library has been placed into chat. And then this slide is an example of a textbook from the Open Textbook Library with author and review affiliations and if information, it has multiple formats available, it's under a Creative Commons license, and it has ancillary materials. And now we will have our faculty panel who will share their experiences and expertise in working with OER. So I will stop sharing my screen. And uh, Alexa, why don't you take it away? Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the textbook I created called Screening Shakespeare. This is in the field of film studies, Shakespeare studies, social justice, and cultural studies. I currently use this book in classes I teach. I teach at George Washington University in the Department of English. And um, as you can see on my screen here, um, this is a completely web-based book. When I set out to design an open access textbook, I thought a lot about what I liked and disliked in the so-called eBooks. 
One problem I see is they are invariably PDF. Even if they are not PDF, they are web-based, they are linear. There's a table of contents. You proceed from chapter one to chapter 10. Yes, they are free and open access, but in a way, I see majority of these books that I reviewed um, failing to take advantage of the medium. When we talk about traditional textbook, the medium is the codex book, meaning print, so um, papers, and then they are transformed into the digital form, which is usually PDF or EPUB format. Um, and therefore, the e bit, the digital bit, it, it's an after, afterthought. I wanted something from the ground up, born digital, right, digitally conceived. This is the result. If you go to so the address is Screen Shakespeare. You can follow along. Screen Shakespeare, one word, dot O-R-G. ScreenShakespeare.org. When you arrive, you see tiles. So this matrix is my idea. I wanted, I wanted something. So this is a headline that's revolving, um, you know, topics to draw learners in. What are you curious about film, about film culture? And these tiles, each one will teach you a key concept, such as mise en scène, you know, adaptation, what do they do aesthetically, <clears throat> socially, and so on. If you go to each sub menu, the, it's, it's not linear. You click on mise en scène. Under this, you can learn about topics such as lighting, composition, costume, set. These are all grouped under the big umbrella term mise en scène. Of course, you have cinematography, you have the same. So, so in a way, this is for you to explore. You click into any of the mini lesson units and it's fully illustrated um, with video clips. Um, I use what the studios themselves release for promotional purposes, as well as, um, as, well as uh, for their uh, promotion of integration of their, of their works into the classroom. So these are on YouTube and completely sanctioned because very often one of brothers were university studio, they will actually have their official channel. So it's a great resource. In the case where it's not possible, I will make my own clip like this. It's very short. Since this is not monetized, this falls under fair use. It is actually very brief um, and specifically for educational purposes. I also offer further reading at the end. So for instance, um, each one, they'll have uniformity, even if you jump around formalism, um, it's a film theory. You first get a definition, you get examples, case studies. In the end, you get exercises so that it's now students' turn. Typically, it'll involve an example, such as a clip, and I'll ask you a question for, um, for you to elaborate. And answer key is sometimes provided here, but in majority of cases, it's provided live in class. So this is not a standalone course, but rather a book with some openness for instructors to modularize and adapt. And as you can see, I have further reading at the very end. You also notice previous and next buttons um, that allows you to go to the next lesson plan, the, the next lesson, such as realism. Uh, but even within the lesson, you can see a lot of hyperlinks as well. So that's what I wanted to promote, a, a, a kind of spider web-like pathway to knowledge. It's not chapter one to chapter 10. I don't even name my chapter. I don't even number my chapters. You jump around based on your need. You can also hover over some key terms um, and definition would show up in a bubble. Uh, so that's, uh, that's very typical. Um, I was able, thanks to the grant, to hire uh, a research assistant um, who helped me build the, the structure of this through a WordPress plugin, but I myself have also learned enough through him. I'm not a coder, but I know enough about HTML5 now to continue this work after he is gone um, to populate all of these, for example. 
um, once the, the larger infrastructure is up. And I can easily, speaking of, um, of, of sustainability, this structure and framework can be copied by any instructor. So the openness is not just the contents. You can just take this and build your own. I know your book would end up looking like this. You can change the color perhaps. But I encourage and welcome anyone to come in and, uh, and, and, and copy this. So it's basically a new template now that you create a book. So in summary, the key takeaways are a book that is open access, that is born digital, taking full advantage of the digital format of presentation instead of imitating print, right? For example, the hovering over definition of key terms, that's really something that is um, web-based. Um, there are things that, that print and PDF style of book do really well. There are things that a web-based interactive format uh, that can do better. So it really depends on what your purposes are. My purpose is visual culture, film, and so there's already a lot of moving images and a lot of interaction. And none of the film textbooks really can do what I do here. They will give you a companion website, but I've surveyed all of them. They are all badly designed. It's not really engaging. And what another advantage I have is today a new film comes out or a scandal or there's a debate. I can update it instantly. So I've been doing that throughout the semester and bringing in the latest so that this is forever green. It's always up to date um, rather than you know waiting for the next edition. The film textbooks, there are several famous ones. They are actually very expensive, upwards of $100. And that's also my concern in terms of not only teaching social justice, but practicing social justice in terms of equity. I want my students to be able to to afford this education, to access it, and to share it with, with their friends. Many of them told me, it's not really just about Shakespeare anymore. They, they take home um, a lot of this knowledge. They're more cognizant of film that is so prevalent in our culture and teach their parents, teach their friends. When they see a film, they see it differently now. And you can revisit this um, at any time to refresh your, 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 your knowledge. So, so in a way, it's kind of engaging is that this works on cell phone as well. So it's adapted to different um, orientation and size of the screen for your tablet, for your mobile phone as well, automatically, um, automatically fits, uh, uh, readjust to fit that. Most importantly, I have a search, powerful search button. So if you already forgot um, a concept we talked about, for example, you search non-diegetic, it'll tell you where this keyword appears. So you can jump to different lessons this way. All right, I'm going to stop here. I'm sure um, there'll be questions. I'm happy to take questions on the design process. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, put any questions into the chat and we can move. And uh, Eugene, uh, please tell us about your project. Sure, I'd be glad to do that. Thank you. Um, well, my approach, my project was uh, a lot more small scale in many ways than Alexa's wonderful textbook, which is just great. Um, well, I shouldn't call it a textbook, I should call it an ebook, uh, an e publication, the, and uh, really uh, looking at things in a, in a new and very different way. And I, I think there's a lot to look at. I'm going to spend a few hours on that uh, site, I know. Um, but my situation in coming into the course, I'm going to, sh uh, can I, I can share my screen, right? So I'm going to go ahead and do yes, that. Yes, you should have. That and already. good. I'm going to uh, go to my Safari where you'll see uh, screening Shakespeare. I was just looking at that. So, um, but that's not what we'll talk about right now. I'm going to close that. Uh, the class that I was, uh, I've been working on in relation to the OER um, textbook is a uh, fundamentals of music class, fundamentals of music theory. I'm in the music department at uh, George Washington. And um, it sits right here. I, I, you can see this is from the GW Bulletin. You can see it's sitting right here. Uh, Elements of music theory, three credits. It's a class that's recommended and required within the music major and minor. So it, uh, it's kind of like a first step class. It does have uh, classes to follow it 
for example, the next course on the list, comprehensive musicianship is kind of the next stage um, for, again, for majors and minors or just for those interested. Um, so it's a class set within a sequence rather than a standalone class. It's uh, not, um, that said, it's not, no experience is required uh, when you uh, join as uh, 11, CMS 1101. Um, and its range is quite wide, uh, unlike uh, some other uh, music and uh, music theory and musicianship classes. It's not uh, particularly narrowly focused on notation, and it's not um, uh, geared only to producing fluency in uh, that particular skill set. We do do quite a lot of music notation. Uh, but we also do a lot of other things as well. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just look at the um, uh, the way the course looks at this point in time. You see, this is actually a live course in Blackboard, and I've uh, used. I haven't designed my own uh, website. Uh, as I say, it's rather more small scale. Um, my adoption of the OER principles. And so this is the uh, course within Blackboard right now. So the main changes that I've made to the course, the main change that I was able to make due to this uh, stipend uh, from uh, OER and was uh, kind of uh, prompted to make uh, by applying to that program and working um, with the group uh, was the adoption of an OER textbook. And I, uh, what I did then was I, adopt, uh, I adopted the textbook, which um, uh, is going to be, if I go to the first uh, module uh, in the uh, course, you'll see that it's linked from the site there. And so, and this is a, uh, a site book, a uh, textbook called Open Music Theory. And so it's published under those uh, Creative Commons license that Melissa was mentioning earlier. And it's uh, completely downloadable and it's quite modular. I was not involved in the publication or writing of this textbook, though actually there were several uh, faculty from this area, including uh, Megan Lavengood at GMU. Uh, but uh, Open Music Theory, as you can see, is a um, natively online, openly open educational resource. And it is intended to um, serve as a primary text uh, and a workbook for undergraduate music theory. Uh, curriculum. So it works very well uh, for my purposes and for our purposes in the course. Uh, the Prior to adopting this as the class text, I used uh, this textbook, which I'm going to click to now, which is published by OUP. Um, it, it's a good textbook. Uh, There's nothing against it. I still like it as an approach, uh, music theory remixed. Uh, but as you can see, it's primarily conceptualized as a physical textbook. Uh, students can get the ebook purchase or to ebook rental. As you can see, it uh, costs basically $60 for the semester to rent the textbook, which is a considerable price. If you were to buy the uh, book itself, it would be as underneath there, you see it's $125. Um, the textbook itself is also, uh, if you went ahead and bought it, uh, and you're a music major or in pursuing a music minor, you probably, uh, you know, it might be good value in the end because uh, it's conceptualized as being covering three or maybe even four semesters of study in the music theory, traditional music theory sequence. Uh, that said, though, obviously there will be people who don't, or maybe just take the one class uh, and don't uh, use the book anymore. So, um, it's definitely um, a, a plus in terms of affordability to have uh, no book, uh, no required uh, fee-based textbook um, there. Uh, so I've been using open music theory and I find it is very, uh, the modular approach is very useful, even though I do, uh, I, I, it is fairly linear as I've used it so far in this course, though I do find Alexa's approach kind of inspirational. Um, that said, as, as it's a course that, uh, you know, uh, has certain standards um, in terms of the uh, students finishing off and there's a, a, a successor course immediately afterwards. So uh, if I don't cover a certain topic uh, to some extent in the, um, uh, this course, you know, my next uh, faculty colleague will be as a, why don't your students know about this? 
I'm joking. But on the other hand, there is that expectation that there will be a stepwise approach building on this. So the linear approach for me works well in this uh, context. Um, what it does allow me to do, however, is very much um, use that linear approach for my own purposes. So you can see, for example, uh, or maybe I can show you, um, it's not immediately obvious that uh, while some of these earlier modules, uh, earlier text links within or uh, textbook links within the module uh, go to specific chapters that are also early on in the textbook, so they link to um, contents which are in this fundamentals chapters. The fundamentals chapters are usefully, they are not um, uh, linearly organized within the context of this opening um, section of the book, but they are nonetheless all within the opening section. But I can also pull things outside. Uh, so this particular um, chapter here comes not from the fundamentals textbook, but from 20th and 21st century techniques. So where, whereas that might be a little bit um, difficult to do in, in a paper format or even in an ebook format, this it's easy to present the different modules or different sections, different chapters from the e-textbook, from the OER textbook um, within the context of the same module and to prompt the students to read in that way. Um, other things that I have done and, and used within this uh, context of the uh, OER initiative is to um, highlight some of my, uh, some videos, some of which I have made, uh, such as um, actually the, none of those I made, but there's some under the uh, links and uh, reading slides links that I have made. But these are uh, amalgamation of mostly YouTube uh, links, which apply directly and can come in nicely immediately after the textbook links, providing an alternative way for students to access that information. And then the assignments, again, are easily uh, available. Some of these um, are from the uh, textbook uh, from the workbook section of the textbook. And so it's nice to be able to organize these again so the students are easily able to access them at this point. They don't have to buy a separate workshop. Um, let's see. I've used for the listening, most listening uh, parts of this course, I use Spotify, which isn't a particularly new addition uh, for me. Um, I've used Spotify for a while, but it is, of course, um, free to, sort of free uh, to students. I mean, there are additional, there are obviously ads within the free version of Spotify, and um, the t sound quality is not as good as the paid version. So that's something that I do uh, still wonder about about whether it's uh you know whether there's better ways than using uh spotify the plus side for spotify is students are all almost all familiar with it or at least familiar with the model that it offers and uh they have easy access to it so it's um, definitely better than um handing out those cds which we used to do uh 10 12 years ago in class which were also expensive as well of course for the students um that's the link I was looking for. Some uh, that's actually videos that I've made uh, within the uh, Echo system in Blackboard, and I have a few of them. I don't have loads, but I'm gradually growing on that to supplement. Um, I think that's most of what I wanted to say, and I hope there's some questions and that I can expand a bit further. But like I said, it offers um, hopefully a, a kind of nice complementary, uh, rather more. Um, uh, less uh, less high powered and, and certainly less interesting approach to the use of OER materials than Alexa, but uh, in the context of the class, it worked for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, we have Dorothy presenting, and then we'll have Q and A at the end. Hi, thank you, Melissa, and everyone. My name is Dorothy Fair, and I am um, happy to be on this panel. I wanted to share with you what I've done in my courses with OER, but um, it's not a part of a stipend. I haven't submitted yet, um, but I certainly gotten some good ideas from Alexa's website design. Um, so I will 
uh, go ahead and uh, share my screen. Um, okay, great. Uh, let's do the share. Uh, okay, so don't see my screen yet. Is is the stop sharing? Is that on? Um, it looks like you should be able to share your screen. Okay. Um, I'm looking for my, you know, information. I don't see it yet. Okay, let's go back, share again. Okay, here we go. I see it now. Great. Okay, so this is my um, Blackboard Ultra course that I wanted to share with you all. It's a six-week um, foundation writing one. And I wanted to, if we have time, show you the foundation writing two, because I used OER in both cases, and there's some pros and cons in the type of textbook that I that I used. So I'm going to go ahead and um, open this course. And uh, what I the difference is in this course, I embedded the access to the OER inside my start here um, folder. So I'm just going to open it. And then it uh, drills down to the different items here. And here I have the main e-textbook, which is Writing for Success. Okay, so this is the book. Now, the one thing that worked for this particular OER textbook is that um, it provided links to the table of contents. This was good because in each of the weekly chapter readings, I was able to just include the link. But in the other OER, it was just like Alexa was saying, because it was a print-based, uh, I literally had to copy and paste the PDF chapters into Word, then resave. Now I'm just so excited about seeing that website. I mean, I'm very much interested in that. Okay, so that's the um, the foundation one. So this first would give the students the access to the full uh, textbook. But if we go down to week one, each of the access, the chapters for the reading is in each weekly folder. So for instance, here is the chapter one reading. And you'll see that it's so easy because for this, they just have to click the link, which I hope will show up. Um, can you all see this? Yes. Uh, yeah, it, it goes right to that textbook, which is really great. And then let's see, I'm gonna exit out back of it. Um, so that works and it works in this particular um, design for this PDF or uh, OER because in addition to allowing the students to download the full textbook and PDF, it provides links to each chapters. So that was very, very easy. Con contrast that to this other course, which is the second part of the sequence. And I'm just gonna put in the course ID to bring it right up. So this is the foundation too. So in writing, this is for a first year freshman writing course broken down in the beginning uh, foundations of writing. And then this course is for a research course. So for this, what I did was instead of embedding it and then start here, I just had the access to the actual OER. So the main textbook was informed arguments. And the second one was let's get writing. Let's yeah, let's get writing. That's because I haven't been able to find one OER that has all the concepts that I need for uh, the learning objectives in the syllabus. So I had to actually use two. So in this one, because it did not provide links, uh, I had to create the PDF for this particular uh, chapter in week one that I wanted the students to read, because what I found was it's very labor intensive for the student if they download the entire PDF textbook, then try to find 
what it is I want them to read in week one. I didn't want to do that to my students. So I went through the labor intensive effort of creating those individual chapters. Uh, but still, now that I know about the website, the digital uh, version, um, you know, even learning that would probably be better than uh, this type of time. Uh, but I didn't know any other way to do it. So remember, I did this all on my own. I didn't get any stipend or grant. I just want, was trying to help my students access the information. The same thing with the second textbook that they had to read, because some of it had to do with um, documentation style, whether, uh, you know, in the MLA type to credit their outside sources. So again, um, I had to do that. So um, basically those were the main differences that, you know, I wanted to show, but for, that's the whole textbook. And so if we go to week one, and if we look down and drill into it, here um, is the uh, PDF for this particular week. And notice I also had to supplement with my own lecture notes because uh, both of these textbooks didn't have uh, all of the concepts that I wanted to do. So within this book, um, these are the pages that I wanted them to read. So I created a PDF for those pages. Another problem for some of the OER textbooks that are based on um, you know, print design, they didn't all have page numbers. So even if I didn't uh, extract the text into little you know, compartments, there would be no page numbers. So, you know, I'm just learning this. So I guess, you know, I just didn't encounter one textbook that, you know, did everything the way that I wanted it to do. So those were uh, some of the examples um, just to show you how I managed, but I didn't use any um, commercial textbooks for this. I was kind of trying to test it out even though using the commercial textbooks would have been easier because a lot of times they provide all of the videos and quizzes, test bank and all of that. So what I had to do was I actually created my own um, quizzes to ensure the students would read the assigned readings. Now there were quizzes on other things like grammar, but I found that if I assign read, now you guys were teaching real exciting courses, I'm teaching writing. <laughs> So the students weren't really all that motivated to read. So I would have to give a little, you know, pop quiz on the major concepts. And I would have to create my own because I didn't use a commercial textbook where, you know, it would have it. So I'm going to, you know, that's pretty much all I wanted to show you guys. So I'm going to stop sharing and we can uh, go to the full thing. Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's very common that faculty aren't finding one specific book that's going to be perfect, but showing especially how you're using uh, Eugene and Dorothy in the classrooms that you can kind of piecemeal together. So even if you're not going completely nonlinear, you can kind of choose the path through the information that you want to show. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to share my screen again. Uh, for the last couple questions I had here to kick off the Q and A, um, so just to get started, what is some you've you've already covered this mostly all of you, but something positive and something difficult about using OER. What have you seen while using? How 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 start? I I find. The OER are very attractive, not just purely um, based on its economic factor. Of course, it's free. Everyone likes free stuff, right? And students, of course, as we all know, increasingly do not buy or do not wish to buy very expensive textbooks or even rent them. Um, there's also the, the there's also the accessibility issue. So traditional books, even in PDF form, you have to ensure it's um, accessible for people who use screen reader, for example. And this is not just a vision impairment issue. 
right? Increasingly, people are busy. I myself, I love screen reader. So I'm in a gym, I'm out and about, I can continue to listen to content. Um, podcasts are all the rage these days. Soon I'll integrate my own podcast into my, my, my textbook. I also have professionally filmed very short um, videos like film studies in three minutes, um, social justice and film in five minutes, that kind of thing. So they're short. Um, and of course you can watch the video, but you can also only listen to them. That's what I love about online OER for all the malleability because you access information by reading in a traditional format, a traditional style, but you can also use screen reader. Um, it'll read it up to you. I have a um, uh, um, universal access button built in where if you click, you can change the contract, the font size, everything. You can even make it read out loud. It's a free plugin, so it would read everything there for you. It takes some effort because if you have illustration, I have to make sure I have all text. So that when it encounters an image, you read out and describe what is in there for you. So you don't actually have to read it with your eyes and you can still absorb the knowledge. That's what I love the most. Um, what is the difficulty? Well, um, for one, <laughs> you require live internet connection. So I can't enjoy this on a plane ride, for example. Um, a bit of a drawback, and it's very difficult to, um, I am, I'm open to and encourage anyone, I'm happy for people to download my stuff, but this is difficult to download. It's not a PDF, so how do you, it's so modularized. That's really one drawback. Um, I'm working on that. If I get another grant, what I'm going to produce is accessible screen reader, accessible PDF version of that. Of course, you won't get you won't get the videos, you won't get the podcast, you won't get the you know film samples, but it's uh, better than nothing. So that the whole thing will be downloadable and still be be kind of accessible and readable without live internet. Um, so that's my that's my next uh, I suppose my next dream. Yeah, there's definitely a lot to think about. I also really liked what you said when you were showing your uh, book that uh, you wanted to take advantage of the specific formats that you were using. And just a lot of things, especially with kind of more film and music, you're not getting the most accurate version of those formats uh, in a physical textbook. Yeah, and I want to say to... Um... Oh, um, sorry. I um, if if you would stop sharing for a little bit, just so I can show. Oh, it. yeah, yeah. Let me. So that's the button I was talking about. It's right here. Um, floating, the universal access. Um, you have this button, and you can manipulate everything. Um, it also tells you how to use the book. You can read it in a traditional way, where you simply use the thematic tiles to jump around. It's not that uh, I appreciate very much what Eugene said. Sometimes um, linear is important because you have to learn about certain elements of musical theory before you can pr proceed. Um, to some extent, it is true for film studies as well, because you can't just, um, this is more um, because I teach a slightly more advanced level and some students, students come in with, different background. So some may know more about critical theory than others. And so for them, they can advance to the to the to the next tile. It's in that spirit. But um, since it's built this way with tiles, you can you can teach it in linear fashion, non-linear fashion. You can use only one tile for one specific purpose. You don't have to use the whole book. Um, all of that. And I also wanted to say to to Dorothy, feel free to to copy this whole template, it's already there. It's a matter of, you don't really need to know coding. Once you know how to create free WordPress account, login, you can populate this. Using my, my template, you populate it any way you want. It'll be terrific writing textbook for free for your use. Thank you, Alexa. I was thinking the exact same thing. <laughs> Yeah, it's already there and it's free. And I, I built it to be very, very elastic and very simple to use. It's really like Word, you, you know how to type in Word, you can, you can use this and eventually build one. The, the hard work is in the beginning, you know, to, to come up with this structure. Um, a lot of it's, a, it's custom and I'm really grateful to the grant to enable me to support um, a, 
a coder in turn who's capable of doing that. I'm sure that was a great help. Uh, Dorothy or Eugene, do you have any positive or negatives that you'd like to share? Mm, uh, sure, yes. Um, the positive is, is self-evident to all of us because uh, these commercial textbooks are extremely expensive you know, even though they have a lot of features with them and we all care about our students and we want to um, offer them either, you know, free or low cost while still um, making sure they meet all the learning outcomes. So obviously that's a positive. Um, I already shared some of the difficult aspects I had, but that was prior to learning so much from Eugene and Alexa, <laughs> you know, um, so I would definitely try out more things. Um, the big thing that I would I would say for finding this information, if you if you're a novice like I am with this, is go to your university librarian. I just want to say that our librarian at UDC was so helpful. All I do is ask her. I'm trying to you know incorporate more OER. And can you help me? And here's my syllabus with objectives. Uh, so she provided several OERs. So then the time consuming part was me going through and matching because that's not her job to do that, uh, you know. Um, but I do appreciate the initial links to the OER. So I think that would be a great first step for any novice like myself. You know, Alexa and Eugene are more experienced with this. So, but I'm sure some of you out there are novices and why reinvent the wheel? Start with your university librarian, but let him or her know what you're trying to do. Um, so that's kind of what, what the advice that I have as well as how I did it. So thank you everyone. Um, I would just jump in and uh, say to Dorothy, thanks for sharing that. And I, I don't know, I'm not, not much more than a novice really. And uh, uh, on my side of things in terms of using the resources that are available, and there's so much, there's so much there, of course, that it's difficult for anybody uh, to, to know it all. But um, I really like the uh, clarity of your uh, Blackboard courses, because I know trying to uh, wrestle with Blackboards uh, uh, built-in um, styles and uh, layouts are not always easy and you, you, you have such a clear, um, uh, a clear attractive pa looking pages for what you have. I'm sure your students, I know they will appreciate it. Thank you. Um, oh, not at all, this looks great. Uh, um, so I guess the positive, I, I think I, I probably all mentioned, um, uh, mentioned most of the positives already, just the uh, ability to be flexible within the uh, within the curriculum. And even though, um, as Alexa uh, mentioned, there's a certain, you know, there's certain linear procedures we do want to follow um, or need to follow, the fact that uh, we don't need to accept necessarily the uh, linear uh, notions that um, uh, the text textbooks or, or traditional concepts do impose uh, on on one, and I guess that's used, been useful for me for uh, one um, reason, which is that uh, I've been uh, just recently actually I've been working uh, with students on the concept of musical forms and musical forms traditionally are often separated by genre. So you get a very different uh, kind of notion of what form is when you think talking about uh, the classical Western tradition, usually white, uh, as opposed to more popular influences, uh, more African diasporic musics. And um, I think the division uh, can be problematic. And so, I found, you know, using this book as a resource where I was able to bring together and consider in the same module approaches to musical form from uh, the Western tradition and from um, popular musics as, uh, as well. So I think that was, that was a positive which I'll continue to develop and draw upon. Um, the second uh, sort of uh, this, uh, this probably was something that surprised me as well. So I'll, maybe I'll, I'll answer two questions at once with this one was um, the built-in uh, difficulty with dealing with the um, 
sort of written work that students need to do because in music theory, as some some of you will probably know or suspect at least, there is quite a, a amount of written work that needs to be completed in terms of notation that if it's beneficial for the students to do in handwriting and even even for the students who um, you know may have access to or may be familiar with uh, score based nota uh, notation program software. Um, it's still useful for them to write it. I mean, research has shown that uh, you know when students write things, they have a different approach at least, and sometimes retain things better than if they're just uh, doing things on a screen. So that was that was a little bit of a problem for me. I started out with the semester just putting up the PDFs and uh, having the students uh, send them back to me uh, virtually, uh, but PDFs the students can't can't complete them virtually. So they were generally having to print them out and then they would have to, uh, you know, take a photo of them, take a, turn them back into a PDF to hand back to me. And then I've, I'm much quicker for me to actually grade them when they're in paper than on screen anyway. So there were, I was kind of, uh, you know, despite the fact that they were existing virtually, I was uh, ended up using quite an amount of paper and just uh, asking the students to print out too. So. As a, I'm going to try and work out a better way to do this for the students this semester. Though I started printing out the PDFs and handing it to them, and they'll hand them back to me. So at least there's only one set of printouts involved, and uh, the students actually liked that a lot. They were like, "Oh, great, you're printing them out!" So they really did like that. So I'll probably continue to do that to a certain extent. But that was a, you know, a, a problem um, not insoluble, but a problem that uh, I encountered that I didn't, didn't expect. Yeah, that's really interesting. I wouldn't have thought of that, but it seems so obvious now that you've brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dorothy or Alexa, do you have anything surprising that uh, have happened with your courses? Can I um, just a quick response here? Thank you, Eugene, for sharing that. I'm about to put in a chat for everyone. Um, this is a completely free and open access online social annotation platform called Peruso with two L. Um, Peruso. Uh, this is kind of a happy intermediary. It's still not print, but you can print it out. Uh, I have students annotate a lot. So you can upload the PDF there um, and the whole class can collaborative, collaboratively annotate the reading um, as part of the assignment. And you would go to that chapter and you see everyone's annotation all at once. Students can individually also just print out their own. So you have the PDF and what they wrote and submit to you as print as well to make grading easier, if that's your preference. Um, it's completely free. I have I, I found it, I find it a more efficient platform than Blackboard to integrate, uh, integrate OER mm -hmm. um, in this way. So and then it's kind of social media inspired because the collaborative annotation has shares features with social media so to motivate people it's not just when when you are writing for a community you write better you are more motivated versus you're writing for one teacher okay okay well thank you um as far as what i found surprising as i said because i was new to exploring this was the variety of ways to access and some of the texts were a little dense, I found. And because I'm teaching writing, it's very important to have concise clarity. That's what I want my students to do. So looking for texts that were that was kind of dense and not organized to the point where I could easily assign, I found that surprising because just like everybody, oh, free, great. Uh, but once I started really investigating, I just found a lot of variation uh, with that, which is really making me think about trying for that grant to write my own because uh, I, I know what I want. And so that's kind of the thing I found very, very surprising. Yeah, I've heard that from other faculty as well, where it's hard to get the exact level that you want for a course. So if it's like a high level engineering courses, sometimes it's too basic what you're finding. So it's interesting to hear that the opposite is also true. Um, I would just say that it, it's very true. Um, my, in my students' feedback, they love the 
interactivity and modularization of my textbook, but they loved also several of them mentioned that it's me who wrote it. And so it's seamless integration in class. Those are my words. Those, it's exactly my text, but exactly the way I wanted it. Um, it's different from, from other textbooks that are more generic um, and may or may not be relevant to your class. So yes, Dorothy, write your own would be the very best, finally, and use it in your own class and other people can use it too. I think that level of customization is just so uh, attractive in terms of OER. And, and it makes my class better as well, since I wrote every word of it. It's so this way, it's not just my teaching, but even the material, it's, it's me. Of course, I still cite others, there's further readings, you can go off, but the core material um, comes from me, so integrates just seamlessly into my lecture. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, a lot of times students will feed off of what you're putting in. So if they can clearly see what you've done, I think that's a really great point of they would be inherently more engaged because you've made the material. Um, Dorothy already kind of covered how she went about finding uh, materials. Do Alexa or Eugene have anything to add about how they approach that? I say that again. Uh, how did you approach finding materials to use? I know you created a lot of it, but the further materials and things like that. Um, I did look at uh, five of the most popular film textbooks that's frequently adopted. I study their structure. I look at what they include, not include. Um, so part of what I have here is conventional, you know, what you will get when you take film studies 101. Part of it is not conventional. For example, my emphasis on social justice, racial justice. Do you, do you hear race or not hear race in music, in film music? Um, is camera angle neutral? Is, is that gender? Is changing gender dynamics? Um, I find all these aspects underemphasized by traditional textbooks. They really talk about the technicality or just aesthetics as if it's, they don't talk about film's whiteness, for example. So um, I went about finding material, finding gaps in materials, and then decided to write my own in order to fill in those gaps. In terms of, um, in terms of the visual material, um, I spend a lot of time on YouTube. YouTube is most is easiest to integrate. So I, I didn't try Vimeo. I, I wanted to the easiest platform. So I look, look up the major film studios, official channels and started from there. Um, I consulted with our librarian on copyright issues when, where I have more obscure films and no clips can be found in a public domain. I would start to create my very short clips, usually under 30 seconds. And it's with copious commentary and notes. So it's for educational, clearly for educational purposes. And there's no commercialization uh, of it. Um, so that's, that, that's my process. But every semester, even as I teach, I continue to update. So that book will look different next month. And I'm teaching this summer as well. I use the same book, but it it won't look the same as now. I keep adding new new material. Eugene, uh, do you have anything you want to share about how you approach finding uh, the playlist that you made on Spotify or anything like that? Oh, um, well, I, I take different approaches to the playlist on Spotify. I mean, some of them are uh, linked to some of them actually created by the um, uh, from the OER textbook. So actually, that tends to be a bit an, uh, annoying, to, uh, honestly, when I use it in class because the way the links work from the website is that they call up Spotify and Spotify opens in my browser, and I don't want it in my browser. I want it on the app, and that's a uh, there's probably an easy fix around, but I haven't found it, and it kind of trips me up every time. But that's uh, just makes me. Uh, uh, look silly in front of the class. So that's not too bad. That could be a good thing. Um, in terms of other materials, I have, as, as you, as I demonstrated, use, as, I, as you saw, I mean, demonstrated, but as you saw, I, I use uh, things on, from YouTube, uh, cu cu curate them obviously before uh, I use them. I don't usually, uh, I have a, 
you know, I have had apps that I download videos from YouTube. Sometimes um, I don't always do that uh, because it does take the video out of its context. So um, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. Um, but I wouldn't say I had a particular approach or any secrets to finding materials. It's just really um, looking around generally online. Um, I have generated a few of my own two videos, but um, you know, often you can find better better things already done, uh, profession, sometimes professionally done. And so, um, yeah, I guess that, uh, I've also taken materials and I do take materials from my, uh, you know, from my students uh, themselves. So I often have an icebreaker question at the beginning of the class, which asks them to say something about the music uh, they're listening to, the music they're uh, using, the music they're listening to or, or playing. And so that makes it, that music makes its way into a, uh, another playlist which we then sort of use uh, and refer to throughout the semester so that gives them a, a, a built-in point of reference hopefully for some of the concepts we're talking about so that's another way I've kind of used to uh, generate material. Great thank you and we're in our last few minutes here so just last any final thoughts or any uh a uh, what was the word I used? A uh, piece of advice that you would like to hand off to anyone? I would say you don't necessarily have to write your own OER tomorrow. Um, it's I spent whole summer on the project plus uh, a fall semester. Um, I'm motivated because I'm passionate about this and I know I'll use it repeatedly. But not everyone has to put in this level of investment and there's plenty out there to adapt. And like Dorothy um, and Eugene showed us to, 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 to modularize and customize taking just one PDF chapter, for example, and it's still good, it's still better than nothing. And you may still use traditional textbook, right? I, I, I would say start small, any bit is meaningful. It doesn't have to be a course only using OER. And I second that advice. It's just go try it. <laughs> exactly. Try it out and you'll learn more as you go. Yeah, I'll third that definitely. It's um, it's a process. And so, you know, as as we know, I'm sure teaching is a process and you just try this, uh, try this technique, jump in. And I, I yeah, I don't think there's anything that should uh, scare anyone. Uh, if anyone's out there thinking of thinking of looking at uh, OER, you know, it's just 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 try it out. Just try it out, a, um, you know, a module or a, a couple of a week or so at a time, and uh, you know, there's a lot there's a lot of resources out there. So just jump in. Thank you so much. And I just put the TOG website into the chat again. So if you have any questions, please reach out to us. Uh, our email is open at wrlc.org. And thank you so much to Dorothy, Eugene, and Alexa. I've learned so much. I have a whole page of notes here. And uh, thank you so much for this discussion and everyone for joining. Thanks. I've learned a lot indeed. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.